Broadcasting from New York City to the world, it's the G-Man Interviews. Welcome. Dorothy Zellner was a staff member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, also known as SNCC, from 1962 to 1967. She worked with Julian Vaughn in SNCC's communications department in Atlanta, ran the Northeast Regional Office of SNCC, and also worked in Danville, Virginia. She spent the 1964 Freedom Summer in Greenwood, Mississippi. After spending 20 years in the South, she returned to her hometown of New York City, where she served as a longtime staff member at the Center for Constitutional Rights and the City University of New York School of Law. She is one of the six editors of the award-winning book, Hands on the Freedom Plow. Personal Accounts by Women in SNCC. Ms. Zellner runs a small family foundation and is a Jewish activist against the Israeli occupation of Palestine. On August 27th of this year, I met with the civil rights icon to discuss the latest developments regarding the deteriorating situation between Israel and the Palestinians in Gaza, how the crisis has impacted Jews in America and abroad, and the role the U.S. continues to play in the ongoing conflict. People in Gaza are trapped according to a recent article that you had written. What specifically do you mean by that? Well, up until this point, and we'll see what happens with the ceasefire, because we don't know exactly what's going to happen. But up until this point, there were five entrances, which are also exits, to Gaza. Four of them controlled by the Israelis, one controlled by Israel. This is hard for an American to understand, because here we are on the island of Manhattan, we think we have five bridges out of here, and we have subways in all directions, and we have Amtrak, and we have three airports. So nobody's telling us we can't go here and we can't go there. They have no airport. They have no seaport. Now, mind you, they are on the Mediterranean Sea. Now, having been there twice, I can tell you that if this ain't like a Mediterranean Riviera, another Riviera, not to mention that the fishermen are not, not allowed to go out more than three miles, you know, international waters, and the Israeli Navy starts shooting at them. I mean, we have videos of that and films of that. In order to travel anywhere, you have to go through one of these exits. So it means that people can't get in and out at will. Now, even if it were another country, if you had a passport, you would be able to go into another country. It also means that there are serious medical issues. You can't get into Israel, which has the hospitals, the high-tech hospitals. There are hospitals in Gaza, but they're not high-tech. And it used to be that people worked in Israel. People in Gaza worked there. Every day they went there, they worked, they went home to Gaza. It's only about a half an hour away. That's what people don't realize. It's a tiny area. Israel is the size of New Jersey. There are less people in Israel than there are in New York City. They have less than 8 million people there. Um, that's in Israel proper. The West Bank has another 2.5 million, and Gaza has another million and a half. All told, this is a very small area of the earth. So what it means is that people can't travel. I know somebody personally who is a leading human rights figure in Gaza, who was given the Robert Kennedy Award, the way he would get out to go anywhere, let's say go to Lebanon, which is the next country over, he would have to go through the Rafa crossing in Egypt and take a plane all the way over the airspace to Israel to Lebanon. So... Millions of people, a million point eight people, are trapped there, and they're not only trapped physically, whatever comes in is monitored, and whatever goes out. Now, this used to be a very, very important agricultural area, but their trucks were stopped, so they'd have trucks full of strawberries. They would all spoil. They would stand there for, for days and days. Then after the last attack, this severe attack, which was 2008-2009, they wouldn't let building supplies in. There was something in the American press about students who had been given international scholarships to study because what people don't realize is the Palestinians are the most highly educated Arab group that there is. They
they got incredibly important to Harvard, to this, to that, to France. They couldn't get a visa to get out. So here you have 1.8 million people, and they're stuck there. Um, aside from all the political machinations that are going on in the UN, for the ordinary person there, their electricity is controlled by the Israelis. Their airspace is controlled. Their water is controlled. It's nothing. It's not unusual to only have water four, time, four hours a day and electricity four hours a day. Now, tell me, can people live like this? Now, what happened in this last attack was unbearably terrible. And now it's up to 2,100 dead, 500 of them children, uh, many, many, many women. And I don't even want to play the women and children card, but it goes to show you if this was targeted bombing, heaven help us, because the Israelis do have a reputation, very high tech. How could so many people be killed? You know, uh, how could there be so much what they call, quote, unquote, collateral damage? So that's the a long answer to the short question. Now, I would ask your viewers, listeners, to imagine what it's like, especially for young men. I mean, we know the young men all over the world they are bursting with hormones. They want to do things. Here's an area where a huge percentage of people, young men especially, are unemployed. They're trapped. They can't get out. So what is the psychology there? Do you have an impetus, you know, a, an incentive to do great things? When you know the likelihood is you will never set foot out of this tiny little area, which, by the way, is the sixth most densely populated area in the world. And I think it's 139 square miles. It's a long strip. And what happens? Well, it's obvious. You can't get out. You have no hope for the future. And they're not even able to defend themselves. No, they have no navy, no... Oh, no army, no navy, no air force. All of this high-tech stuff that we saw on television with the tanks and then this and that. They don't have one, not one tank. I happened to have gone to the West Bank, and I saw what these Israeli tanks do. They are so massive. They're nothing like what we see in the movies, you know, with tanks going over the hills, you know, in World War II. They're gigantic, and they're unbelievably heavy. And I've been in towns in the West Bank where they said that when the Israelis invaded in 2002 in force in the West Bank, the weight of the tanks was so great that it crushed underground pipes, water pipes, and all other kind of pipes. So when they do a ground operation, just by them being there, they're doing damage, even if they didn't shoot one single thing. So, yes, they have nothing. This is what they have to protect themselves. Basically, they have homemade bombs. Uh, they shot 4,000 4, rockets. The overwhelming percentage of them fell nowhere near anybody, did nothing. Now, I'm not saying it's great to have rockets thrown at you, and I'm sure the Israelis, you know, were under incredible psychological trauma for having rockets thrown at you. But this is not high-tech stuff. Just looking at the numbers. Palestinian dead, 2,100. Mostly civilian. Overwhelming, a huge number of children. Four civilians in Israel, and 64 soldiers. Now, 64 soldiers for them is a very high percentage because it's a small country, as I've said, and they have a small but very powerful army. So if you look at the numbers, you say, well, you know, if they sent 4,000 rockets, they have to be ineffectual, otherwise they would have done more damage. Now, what's happening inside Israel, and this is even being covered now in the Jewish press, is an enormous explosion of right-wing racism. And even Israeli press commentators talking about how 300 Israeli Palestinian children, oh, well, poo-poo, 400, oh, poo-poo. But one child, because recently, in the past couple of days, a four-year-old was killed, an Israeli child, and all of a sudden, everybody's hysterical. So people around the world are raising really serious questions that they obviously only care really about their own people, that they couldn't care less about Palestinians. And there's a real question about whether they even think Palestinians are even human, whether they are even people. And 
not only has this late thing been disastrous for the Palestinians, it's been disastrous for the Israelis, but in a different way. Because for the first time, actually the first time since the state has been founded, there are now people who are roaming the streets, actually beating up Palestinians, and the police do nothing. And there is, as I said, this explosion of racism, and the government has gone wildly right-wing. The analogy would be if our government all of a sudden was captured by the Tea Party. The Tea Party actually might not even be as bad. I mean, they are all, some of the ministers in the government. I'm not talking about fly-by-night people. I'm talking about people who are leading the government. Some of them have openly called for transferring all the Palestinians out, you know, forcing them to leave. I'm glad you raised this point because I was going to ask you why is it Prime Minister Netanyahu taking such a hard-line approach to all of this? And, I mean, he's been on Sunday morning talk shows and he seems to be very, very angry and there's, like, no remorse at all. Well, he's kind of an unusual case because he was never really liked very much in Israel. According to the things that I'm reading in the Israeli press, in the Israeli-English press, that is, which is limited, he's not a terribly strong guy either, but he's very responsive to the right wing. In other words, he is sort of a creature of the right wing. They tell him what to do. They push him. Um, the right wing is remorseless. Some of it is religiously oriented. Some of it isn't. Some of these right-wingers are secular, as secular as I am. Some are religious, who believe that God gave the Jewish people every inch of that territory from the Jordan River to the sea. That's it. God gave it, and it's written in a book. It was written in a book 3,000 years ago, and nothing has changed, and whoever wrote it, it was God. The other part of the right wing is secular, they don't believe any of that, but they say they want the whole territory also because they say we're right up against the Palestinians. How can we deal with our security? And the truth is they can't, and they won't ever be able to deal with it until they make peace. That is the only way out. What it means, I mean, people have been yelling for 30 years already about two-state solutions. They have done everything they possibly could to prevent two states. I gave you this little map. Where would you have two states? Now, in the territory that is left, is this a state? Could this possibly be called a state? No, all of these areas are separated by Israeli roads. They can't even get from one town to another town without going through checkpoints. And then Gaza is all the way over here separated. They would have to make a connection. They used to be able to be a two states. That was maybe possible. How is this possible? Okay, so let's say that was the big thing. And actually, 30 years ago, when people said they wanted two states, the right wing is hysterical. Did you know that? Now, Netanyahu, up until recently, claimed, well, of course, we'll, we'll be further to two states. All we want is our security. Turns out he didn't mean that either, because in July he said there will never be. So this is the story here in these four little panels of this card that I gave you, which starts off in 1947. It goes to the present. And this is what it is about to get all of this territory. Here's the Jordan River. Here is the Mediterranean. So Netanyahu is responding to his constituency. Now, if his constituency said, we can't go through this again, we can't go through the terror of having all of these rockets falling, you've got to make a deal. He would make it. But what's happening, unfortunately, is that the Israeli populace has moved to the right. So there is no demand coming from them. Now, it used to be, years and years ago, this was a whole different country. First of all, it was a country that did have a sort of socialist structure. There were the kibbutzim, which were the communal farms. There was health care for everybody and so forth. A lot of that has been eroded. Now they're just a capitalist country like everybody else. I remember in 1982, when they attacked Lebanon, another famous incident where these right-wing Christians went and murdered people in these two refugee camps, Shatila and Sabra and Shatila. There was a demonstration in Tel Aviv. Now, mind you, their population 30 years ago was maybe between five and six months. They had a demonstration in Tel Aviv, 500,000 people. 
10% of the population of the country was in a demonstration to stop that war. Now, completely different. The country has moved to the right. Now, they did have demonstrations during this Gaza attack, 10,000 people. Now, 10,000 people in the middle of a country that was at war was actually really remarkable because we haven't had 10,000 people here in New York. There have been worldwide demonstrations, like in Cape Town, South Africa. They had a demonstration over 100,000, and they said it was the largest demonstration they had had in South Africa since the end of apartheid. And they had demonstrations all over the world. It was amazing. It was totally amazing. So now you have this country that has become very right-wing and cannot be separated from the fact that it's racist. Because the Jewish press in Forward, which is the main Jewish newspaper, wrote an article this week about how teenagers in the high schools are unbearably racist. And they'll openly say, of course I would kill Arab. Absolutely, I would kill Arab. They're even shocked that you would even ask them a question. Of course. And the reason for that is that the educational system has not challenged these students and said, wait a second, there's another way think because now unfortunately in the great democracy in the Middle East there is no other way to think. And one of the leading journalists in the country, whose name is Gideon Levy, who writes for Haaretz, he now has bodyguards that are provided by the newspaper. But they're afraid he's going to be murdered because he is definitely a dissenting voice. And he just wrote an article saying to and he is speaking only to his to his people. He's speaking to the Israeli people. He's saying, you care more for this one four-year-old. What happened to you when there were hundreds of children in Gaza who were being killed? Did you care about them? Did you even think about them? So he is challenging them, and his, he feels that his, his life is in danger. Speaking of the children, those who are in support of Israel's actions are quick to make the point that Palestinian children are taught to hate the Jews from a very early age. What is your response to that? I've been to Gaza twice. They are taught to hate and fear the planes that come overhead. And to my everlasting shame, those planes have a Jewish star on them. I mean, the Israeli flag is blue and white Jewish star. There is a conflation between Jews, since that is our, has always been our designation, that star, meaning Judaism, and the state of Israel. I always told people there that I was Jewish. And it meant nothing to them, because what they mean when they say Jews, they mean Israeli. There is really very little concept of traditional anti-Semitism that I ran into at all. But they have a very formidable enemy, and that enemy is Israel. So they often don't say the Israelis attack them. They'll say the Jews attack, and they make that kind of conflation. And I remember speaking in, in Massachusetts, and a Jewish woman came up to me afterwards, and she said, I'm very upset, you know, about what you've been saying. And she said, they say it's because we're Jews, that they're being attacked by Jews. And I said to her, listen, I'm Jewish also, but what would you say when the plane that comes over and drops a 500-pound bomb on your apartment house has a Jewish star on? I mean, that is, requires a level of sophistication that most people don't have. That doesn't mean to say that there isn't anti-Semitism in the world. There is anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism, traditional, my understanding of traditional anti-Semitism is you hate a people because of who they are. It is like I'm saying, Gary, I hate you because you're black. It's exactly the same thing. Hatred, unreasoning hatred for people because they have either they look different, they sound different, they have a different faith, and out of that comes all of these myths. So, you know, the usual from the Middle Ages, the myths of Christian, uh, you know, drinking Christian children's blood or making matzo with, I mean, and then became much more sophisticated, the Jews control the world and stuff. I see very little difference between the myths that, that came for black people. Oh, shiftless, lazy, you know, or, these are all reasons why you should hate somebody for having no reason to hate them. You know, you erect this sort of structure 
so that you can somehow say, well, of course I hate them. It's because they did X, Y, Z, even if they didn't do X, Y, Z. And to bomb a synagogue is anti-Semitism. If you're bombing the synagogue because you hate Jews, that's anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, what has happened is that Israel's behavior is so outrageous that they have opened the door to saying, well, since they use, they have a Jewish star, that anybody else who has the Jewish star agrees with them. And that's where there is this conflation. But I believe me, I don't say that there's no such thing as anti-Semitism. There is, definitely. And it's growing, and it's a big worry. And it's going to be very, very difficult to separate out what is legitimate criticism of Israel and anti-Semitism. Now, the Israelis and the right-wing Jews here say, well, you can't criticize Israel because it will lead to anti-Semitism. So what that means is the rest of us progressive Jews, we have to keep quiet, criticize Israel, because it'll turn out to be anti-Semitism. And that's their tactic, and it's been a very good, it's very useful, potent tactic for them. This is very worrisome, and this is why it's so important for the Jews to speak out, the progressive Jews to speak out, which is why I chose to do this. This is our mission. We have to do this. I mean, Snick told us years ago, we have to work in our own community, and and I am, and this is tough. I want to tell you this is tough. The area over this issue is beyond incredible. And you will have ordinary people who seem they have an ordinary grasp of human relations and manners and so forth, people friendly, polite. You get on this issue, people turn and they go from zero to sixty in a second. And it's really frightening to watch that. And people say to me, Well, you were in the South, all these white people, they were the same. They actually weren't the same because the ones who were screaming, they were always screaming. They were never perfectly normal people to begin with. And then they didn't bother screaming. They just tried to kill you. This is different. This is tough. But it has to be done. And actually what's happening now is that there is a growing sentiment in the Jewish community here that what Israel is doing is wrong. That it's just plain outright wrong. And the newspapers are printing things that they would never have printed. Two years ago, we this article about racism among Israeli teenagers, the forward printed it, forward would never have printed it, never. They've done all kinds of surveys. They say young people, people under the age of 30, Jews under the age of 30, they're not so uh, connected to Israel. It's worrying the Zionists incredibly because they've always counted on people to come over there, to become citizens. There's a word for it it's called making aliyah, the Hebrew word for going up, but what it means is to emigrate. And half of the Jews in the world are in Israel, but the other half are not in Israel and are not going to Israel. Now, there are some areas like France, which has had many uh, anti-Semitic incidents. The Zionists are openly hoping that people do leave France and go to Israel. I mean, then they will have more people coming in and white people coming white Jews, because actually, now that you've got me started, there are Western Jews, and there are people who come from Northern Africa, and from other countries, Middle Eastern countries, and there's friction between the Western Jews and, they call them the Mizrahi, the, the, what used to be called the Oriental Jews, and there's been friction for years, decades, because the, the European Jew rose to the top, became leadership, and so forth. I mean, have we not seen this before, right? But at any rate, uh, I think probably people are hoping that there will be more immigration coming from the West because of this anti-Semitism, which is, as I said, a lot of it is real. This was not always the case in the Jewish community. In the 20th century, this was not the case until Jews were obliterated by Nazis because the overwhelming majority of Jews wanted to stay where they lived. They wanted civil rights. They were just exactly, I mean, it was exactly the same as the black community. The black community, there were efforts for people to go to Africa. It didn't take. And people said, we worked here, we slaved here, our blood is here, our people are here, we're staying here, we have as much right to be here as anybody. The Jews in Western Europe said the same thing. And 
they did not like the idea of the creation of the state of Israel. They said, we're not going there. We're not going there. We're staying here. And there was a Yiddish word for here. And some of the organizations used that word. And it's called uh, It means here-ness, which you can't translate into English. Those people were in Poland. They were in the Soviet Union. Then they were killed by the Germans. The whole story would have been completely different if there hadn't been a Holocaust. And the Holocaust is another way, you know, that people are urged to be in lockstep. Holocaust is supposed to justify the creation of Israel. But the Zionists worked towards creating Israel long before the Holocaust, long before, decades before. 1898 was the first Zionist conference. That was 40 years before, before Hitler came. So the whole history of Zionism is something that people will have to examine. And along with that, they have to examine what happened to the Palestinians in 1948. The Palestinians call it the Nakba, N-A-K-B-A, and it means the catastrophe. This is the catastrophe. This is how we were, and this is how we are. And there actually is a Jewish-Israeli group which is trying to teach other Jews about the Nakba. Now, this is extremely interesting and, of course, has parallels to this country. For example, you and I are sitting on 94th Street area 400 years ago was India. Of course, the Indians didn't think they owned the earth. The Native Americans were much more civilized than anybody. They said, we don't own this. How can you own the earth? How can you own the air? But here, it's a little closer because it's 60 years not 400 years. Most of the places in Israel are on top of Palestinian villages. And this group teaches Israelis about the Nakba. We have to start talking about the Nakba because you have to go to the root. The root of all of this, Gaza and everything else, is what happened in 1948. And the Jews were in a terrible condition after World War II. A lot of them couldn't go anywhere the United States, which now is so wonderful and helpful towards Israel, would not let the Jews in. That's the reason why a lot of people went to Israel after World War II, because they had to. <laughs> they wanted to come here, but we had immigration quotas. We wouldn't let them in. Um, by teaching the Nakba, this gets to the root. The root is we lost 6 million people, the Jews. We had nowhere to go. We went to a place and we threw those people out of their home. This is something that history is not tolerating. Obviously, if you're going to be fighting and killing thousands of people every three years because of what happened 60 years ago, that has to be rectified. And there are Jews inside Israel who are trying to rectify that. For example, the Palestinians say they want to go home. They want to go back. The Israelis are saying, what utter nonsense. How can they come back? We don't have room. First of all, they have room. That's not. I've been there. They have room. The key thing is, if more people come back, or if we one state where they have equal rights, we won't be in control. That is true, and that's what people are going to have to deal with. As bitter as it is, you will not be in control. There will not be a state that is a Jewish state. And the fact of the matter is, it's not a Jewish state now, and that's what people don't understand. There are 7.9 million people in Israel. About 20% of them are Palestinian. They're Palestinian citizens of Israel. They are the Palestinians who stayed after 1948, who managed to stay as opposed to all the others who were forced out. At no time in the history of the United States since the Civil War have black people ever been more than 12%. Would we say this is a white country? I don't think so. So what you have actually is a country called Israel, which has a majority of Jews, but a very significant minority of non-Jews. And it's not only the Palestinians, it's the 60 or 100,000 foreign guest workers who reside there, who have resided there for years. They're not citizens, but they are residents there. And then you have a healthy number of Christians who reside there because of Jerusalem and because of you know, the whole Christian origin. 
So in essence, what you're saying so is it's a saying, multicultural state yes, as opposed to a Jewish state. Yes, a multi-ethnic, multicultural state is what Israel is right now. But the Jews control it. And this is what this is about. This is about control of one ethnicity over another. Now, the fact that I am a nominal member of the controlling ethnicity does not cause me any joy whatsoever. But that is the fact. And now people are starting to talk about it. And that's what people can't stand. That's why the hysteria is so tremendous. See, my theory, and I must say I am in the minority, is that I think we have turned the corner here. I think we're going to win this. This one, we're going to win. I would like to be alive. I don't know if I'll be alive. This one, we're going to win. Because this is not sustainable. An ethnic state in the 21st century is not sustainable. And any other attempt to make ethnic states have all failed. They failed in Africa. They failed between the Tutus and the, and the other tribe. They failed. It cannot have one ethnic state. You can't. It's, it's not stable. At this point, do you believe Israel should be charged with war crimes? Well, I think there were war crimes probably by both sides. If the war crime is firing on civilians, then it's obvious there are war crimes on both sides. But the context of the war crime, the Palestinians can make a case before the UN, if it ever comes to that, that they actually were firing in self-defense because Israel is the occupying power. The occupying power has certain obligations under international the occupying power is not allowed to settle its own nationals in the land of the occupied. And this has been violated 500,000 times because 500,000 settlers live in Palestine. Okay? This is totally, this comes from World War II. All these international human rights people learn the hard way because of what happened in World War II. The UN says that an occupied people have the right to self-defense. Now, the Israelis said, well, we're doing this in self-defense. Well, if they have the right to self-defense, why don't the Palestinians? So whoever investigates this is going to have a very thorny decision to make because in some cases, this is self-defense, actual self-defense. In other, ca- in other cases, it's targeting civilians. The other thing that Palestinians will be able to say is that You can't make out a case that they were actually targeting anything since most of their rockets fell nowhere. They fell in fields. They fell in people's backyards. They didn't fall on an open market. They didn't fall in a a high rise. The Israelis are really, they definitely will have war crimes charges against them. Definitely. There's no way. I mean, as I pointed out to you, we are sitting, we are surrounded by high rises. Across the street there, there is a, a crazy person or a terrorist on the 11th floor. The U.S. Army is not going to come by and drop a bomb on that building. And the police department is not either. They are not going to do that. And the only time that they ever did such a thing was against the move people in Philadelphia. So I think that I think they are in trouble. They're, if it ever gets to the International Court of, of Justice, they're, they're in trouble. But I think if, you, if you're firing a rocket and you kill billions, as I said, that has to be examined. But I think what also has to be examined is your, if you have no other recourse, that, that's also an issue. And self-defense is an issue and the obligations of the uh, occupying power. Those are all things that the international human rights people are going to have to, to deal with. But going by the numbers alone and the amount of buildings that were destroyed, and level, they say, even with money pouring in, it will take them 10 years to rebuild. I mean, it is a human catastrophe what has happened. So that's that's a complicated issue. But I think I think the Israelis are definitely worried, and that's why they're fighting tooth and nail. That's why they won't let here here is the great democracy in the Middle East. They won't let Amnesty in or Human Rights Watch in to even look around. Even and actually, those two organizations have been critical of the Palestinians when they felt it was necessary. They don't trust them. They don't want them in. They, they know. They know what, what will happen. It will be the Goldstone Report times 10. How much of an impact do you believe the boycott 
divestment and sanctions movement is happening. This is a nonviolent technique. Now we, we see, but we see, you know, that this actually will be a very viable technique. And before this even happened in Gaza, definitely the Presbyterian Church had voted to disinvest from three, country, three companies that did business in Israel, the Soda Stream, Soda Stream had lost business. There are stupid chapters of Students for Justice in Palestine, at, I think, at, at least 100 campuses in the United States, and they're all pushing BDS. Now, BDS is definitely, uh, uh, for a long time, the right wing said, oh, this is getting nowhere, this is nothing. And it's, it's true, we're definitely having uh, an impact. The European countries are taking out their pension funds. I mean, they're taking out big, big money. It's hurting them, absolutely hurting them. The thing that has got to change, that the only thing I think that will really bring about a real change is the United States role. And this is where everybody who is a citizen here or even a longtime resident who pays taxes has something to say about it. Our tax money killed those children in Gaza. We did it. Those bombs have our name on it. And our tax money has $3 billion a year been going for a year, buying the most sophisticated weapons, the drones, all of the Israelis buy this stuff from Boeing and all of the Lockheed Martin and all the big companies in the United States. So we have a nice, tidy little thing going, but for you and me who are paying our taxes, we don't get anything out of Lockheed and Boeing. And Boeing, they don't do anything for us. This is a nice, tidy little game here. And we pay for it, and we've got these morons in Congress who jump up and down, you know, and we love Israel, we love this. I mean, I have to say that the mayor of New York has done, he ran on some very good things. Stop and frisk alone, I was ready out there. But, you know, the very first thing he did after he was mayor was he gave this secret speech to take that. And then we have these people standing on the steps of City Hall. I was down there. We stand with Israel. And so the press, some, uh, the forward came over and asked me what I thought. I said, well, how can they stand there? If this is the city of New York. This has a big Palestinian community. It has people from all over the world, 180 languages speaking. They stand with Israel. Have I ever, have you ever seen them stand there and say, we're standing with France? We're standing with, you know, any country? That was utterly ridiculous. Utterly ridiculous. And then when the mayor says, you know, he stands with Israel, and and Schumer, of course, stands with Israel. And now Cuomo has gone there. You know, he went. He stood for Israel. They asked him, why why don't you go and see the Palestinian side? Oh, he didn't have time. We don't have time in our schedule. That's going to stop. That's going to stop. Because someday, well, I'm hoping we get an, an actual educated electorate who will say, hell no, we don't want this money. If people in the United States don't come to the understanding that the root is endemic systemic racism that has never been rooted out, we will have St. Louis, we will have Ferguson, Staten Island, we will have, this will go on and on and on. And we live in a system that thrives on exploitation of people. And the thing in the Middle East will go on and on forever until the basic issue of occupation and dispossession is, is dealt with. If that is dealt with, having been there, I want to tell you that the relationships that I saw, now this was years ago, and maybe people are more bitter now, the relationships that I saw between Palestinians and Israelis who were working together on the same side was a wonderful sight to see. And unless it's been totally destroyed now, there is the little seed that could grow. I mean, there's so many similarities between these two people. You know, you talk about the dietary restriction. Hello, Muslims have the Jews. You talk about burial. You be buried within 24 hours. Muslims, many, 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 many similarities. And, you know, when people fight side by side, that's what I saw in SNCC, they have a bond that is unbreakable. If those people are allowed to somehow deal with Justice. People are going to have to have justice. 
the justice to have some recompense for your house being stolen and your life being ruined. They have to have some recompense, otherwise they will not they will not rest. And the Jews got some recompense, but unfortunately it was at the expense of the Palestinians and not the people who really did it. You know, I might say a totally different thing if they had given death of Germany to the Jews, because that's what really needed to happen. Because the German population was supporting Hitler up until the end, up until this minute. They never had a, a resistance, never. Okay, you want to do that to people, kill six million people? All right. How come, how come there was never any serious conversation about giving, yeah, let's give, we'll give half of Germany to the Jews. Never, never. That would never have happened. And, and within a few years, Germany was right back where it was. So the Jews have suffered a horrible time. The Palestinians have suffered a horrible time. One group cannot be made the scapegoat for something that, that they didn't do. They didn't do. Various news reports have indicated that prominent African Americans yes. have traveled to Gaza to assess the situation. Do you suspect that this could have a profound impact on the relationship between blacks and Jews here in America? Well, um, I think it will have effect, an effect, but it will have two different kinds of effect. There have been people in the Jewish community who have said that black people were anti-Semitic for years. That that's, doesn't come as any surprise to you or to anybody. There are people in the Jewish community who have been struggling about this issue, who have needed black allies. I think it's extremely important to develop. And by the way, so do the Israelis, because they are sending tons and tons of people over to Israel on free trips. And I have been told that, you know, you go to Israel now, here's a bus full of black people going here and there, tour buses. So they understand. For us to have Archbishop Tutu, who I think even a moral midget would understand that he is one of the great freedom fighters alive today. Some of these crazy Zionists may call him an anti-Semite, but they're not going to get away with that. I mean, it's nothing in his life that he has ever shown any shred of anti-Semitism. Then we have people like Robin Kelly, who has gone, lots, several other professors, there's Angela Davis, there's Alice Walker, there was Vincent Harding, who recently died, was one of Martin Luther King's, you know, close friends. Uh, there's uh, Bill Fletcher. I mean, there are really dozens and dozens, Clay Carson, an outstanding historian, they've all gone and they've seen it themselves. And having them talk about it has the stamp of credibility. Because the people who experience racism know what it looks like, right? Now, I there are difficulties with this because there is a very strong thread in the black church and the black liturgy that says we are the children of Israel and use the children of Israel as a metaphor for themselves. And this has been one of the inhibiting factors against black people coming out on, in, in terms of the Palestinians. Also, I think there's a totally understandable thing, like we have our hands full with racism here, please. You know, how many crosses can we carry at the same time? So I understand that, but I think this is extremely important. Now, it may mean that some people will say, uh, well, all of these people are anti-Semites who have gone there. I don't believe they get away with that. If you go there and you say, wait a second, I was at a checkpoint, and I saw all the Palestinians being herded like animals through this checkpoint, and here all the, the Jews just walk right through, oh, hold up your passport, keep on going. I mean, you as a black man, you're going to say, wait a second, this feels familiar to me in my life. This feels familiar. Those busloads of black people are not being taken to checkpoints, and they're not being taken to Palestine. And the other thing, in my final word, people who have been really neglected are the Palestinian citizens of Israel, and people do not understand, black people definitely do not understand this, and neither does anybody else. That the black people, that the Palestinian Israel are, by any standard, second-class citizens. And I can send you an article that appeared in Haaretz, in the Israeli press. During this whole episode with Gaza, there were 350 Palestinians who were arrested for protesting. In Israel, not one 
Jew. And they have a very difficult time. People who support Israel will say, well, we have a democracy. We have the freedom to vote, which they do. And we have me Arab members of Knesset. They do. They're a tiny minority. They never sit on important committees. And they're always under pressure to say that this is a Jewish state. But how can they say that this is a Jewish state when they're Palestinian citizens? It's as the impossible. It's a state called Israel. I'm not for abolishing a state called Israel, but a state called Israel has to have equal rights for everybody. And that's the other thing about a black ally. This is what we fought and died for for 50 years. Equal rights for everyone under the law. Any American, any American will tell you they believe that. Somehow, when you get to Israel, it, it no longer exists anymore. Equal rights for what? Throw it out the window. This one we're going to win because equal rights for everyone will run. And I could go on for another three hours. But <laughs> <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. So thank you very much. All right, and I'm happy to come back. I'm not, I'm happy. You're, you <laughs> In closing, I realize there are many Jews in this country that fully support Israel's actions. I also realize they will take issue with this episode and Ms. Zellner's comments. In my continuing effort to present both viewpoints on any given issue, I would like to extend an open invitation to have a leader from the Jewish community or regional expert appear on the show to provide their assessment of the conflict and explain why Israel should not be chastised for its actions. Those interested in taking me up on my offer can contact me at from the gman at gmail dot com. That's F R O M T H E G M A N at gmail dot com. I'm the G Man, and until next time, stay cool, stay safe, and stay informed.